This is a Momentum Media production. Investing insights with Right Property Group. Exploring trends in real estate and helping property investors gain financial security. Okay, everyone, how are you going? Phil Tarrant here, co-host of Investing Insights of Right Property Group. With my co-hosts, hosts, the Brains Trust of this uh, operations. We've been at this now for many, many years. Victor Kumar, Steve Waters, uh, Directors, Right Property Group. Gents, how are you going? Going well, mate. Yeah, Phil. Yeah, a couple of long weekends back to back. Rejuvenated, yeah. re-energised. It feels like this period through uh, April, if it sort of aligns, it's great. You know, I think if you had four days off, you could have had, I don't know how many umpteen days holidays, but um, you sort of lose half a month, really, don't you? So three weeks of of uh, long weekends, but, you know. Yeah, I feel, uh, even though the breaks are good, I just feel unproductive. Mm, yeah. Yeah, it's just a point where, uh, you know, you've got some traction with your New Year's goals and then uh, Easter hits. And then if you take your four days off and go into Anzac Day with long weekend as well, you're right, it just takes the momentum totally out of the mix. But again, uh, we do also need to recharge as well. So if you look at it from a uh, you know, logistics point of view and all that, and talking of elections and governments coming in and all that, most governments have you know 100-day plans and all that. So if you look at it from the beginning of the year to now, you're sort of sitting at 90, 100 days. So you should be at least a third of your way through your New Year's goals anyway, in theory. Well, we spoke at length, Victor, about those New Year's goals at the uh, the turn of the clock 2021 to 2022, um, and it was at that point in time when we were smack bang in that new outbreak of the uh, Omicron uh, variant of the COVID. Uh, what we now know is that largely all restrictions uh, are now behind us, even household contacts, uh, contacts were removed uh, last Friday in uh, Sydney and also in Melbourne which means that if someone in your house has COVID, you can still go about your business uh, if you're not showing symptoms. So obviously trying to get us back to some normal operating uh, pattern. And you mentioned, Vic, um, moving into the federal election 21st of May, literally a month away, who and how that's going to fall. Unlike the last election, we spoke at length around this, um, probably not dominating too much in this election cycle, um, big noise around affordability and how to get Aussies in the markets. And we should have a chat about that at some point. And it's sort of connected in with what I really want to get in today with you guys is, you know, this notion that the property market is absolutely in free fall right now. And I think we probably need to drill into that because is it really fact or fiction? Now, uh, depending on who you listen to and what you listen to, you would think that the market is dire right now, particularly as lead up into the election. So I'd like to crack that as well. But Vic, mate, what's going on with the election? What do you think about property? Um uh, the key point is that they're trying to make housing more affordable. And the big issue around it, we should chat about it, is that um, by helping Aussies into properties, and we've even seen that they've uh, ratcheted up the amount you can borrow uh, or the purchase price of properties now in, in Sydney and Melbourne. The big question is, is that if you're borrowing with a 5% deposit and markets go down, you're going to find a lot of Aussies in negative equity. Do you subscribe into this? Look, if the market did go down, yes, you'll be in negative equity. I think the more important thing is uh, the affordability from a household point of view when the rates do go up, because really there is no exit out of it. If you're really redlining your borrowing capacity, not, not, not from a bank's point of view, but from a family budget point of view, and the rates go against you, and you may uh, start a family uh, or, or buy a car on a lease, All of a sudden, you've got too many moving parts there, all of which is costing you more and more money and throw in the negative equity. If that was going to happen, you're asking for trouble. Yeah, and and I don't like to think that a lot of people may find themselves in that situation simply because you're not going to be able to control what happens to property markets moving forward. And we'll get into that, whether or not they are in free fall or not. Um, But, um, you know, it is a very, it's a sensitive policy. Uh, and I can see why uh, the government is saying, well, this is our way into it. But, you know, just because it's available, I wouldn't be um, ushering as many people as possible into this notion of home ownership where we've probably got to change our mindset that maybe uh, we're going to have generations of renters moving forward, Vic. Hmm. Yeah, I agree. Look, we tend to get this every election uh, election time, right? The housing affordability rears its head up because it, it resonates with the general public. But really, there's nothing that really is done to make housing affordable. 
Because at the end of the day, it comes back to supply and demand, the ease of getting money. Yes, there are schemes like the first homeowners grant, the um, deposit scheme and so forth, but the market reacts accordingly. So if, if you had 10,000 as a first homeowners grant, automatically the market jumps up by 10, maybe 20K, pretty much the day it gets announced. So there needs to be a better well thought out process. And one of the things that has been bandied around, which sort of has been shoved into the back, onto the back burner, is the stamp duty situation in most states. And um, I think that would be a far better approach in that sense, because that, that when you look at it, that's a big cost in itself. Mm. Right? But we need to acknowledge that we are already in a major housing crisis from a supply point of view. And regardless of what you throw at the mix, unless we substantially increase the supply and make it a lot more easier for people to get into property ownership, this problem is not going to go away. And in fact, Steve, you'd recall with you and me doing substantial renovations, many renovations over the years, one of our favorite things is actually ripping up the carpet and finding those articles uh, that are uh, slotted in underneath the carpet as padding, where even back in the 70s, they were still talking about housing being unaffordable and how you know the next generation won't be able to get into, into a property ownership. But guess what? We all did. Well, it was even back further than that. It was, I think we saw the latest one was back in the late 50s, the same yes, argument right. on, yeah. the, on the daily newspaper, how are our kids going to be able to afford their own home. But what's interesting in today is, and we've touched on this a few times, whether it be via the podcasts or the Facebook Lives, et cetera, that, is that the government of today and whether the government of tomorrow, whether uh, Liberal or Labor, are in a checkmate position. They are damned if they do and they're damned if they don't. You know, we've talked about the reason that we are here today is because of those levers predominantly back in 15, 16, 17 being pulled via APRA and investors not having the ability to purchase, therefore supply accommodation, even though the intent was there and the ambition was there, but we just couldn't borrow as much as we could today. Now, I'm not saying that we should have this free flow of credit because that leads inevitably to boom periods. And that's not healthy for a sustainable market. But as you touch on, somewhere in the middle is the happy ground. And it is a supply and demand scenario. Australia is very closely tied to residential real estate and the wealth effect that follows onto that, which propels local and you know, the broader economy as such. So it becomes, well, how do we loosen supply? How do we cut red tape, rezone land, to have the ability to be able to provide, build and provide more accommodation. Now, some would argue that excluding Sydney, the other states and territories have the ability to keep expanding, expanding, expanding out via open you know, greenfields, as we refer to it. But you still need to eradicate the red tape that comes along with opening up new plots of land not just by one or two, but by tens of thousands. Then we have the other problem, even if that was to be gone tomorrow and the transition into opening up these new tracts of land became more apparent, where do we get the materials from? Mm. Where do we get the labour from? Where do we get the funding from? So this is why it's a checkmate position. Quite, It's extremely unique, the predicament that, that we're in, but the bottom line is that rents are going up, Tenants will have to pay more money, and we've all been tenants at one stage or another. In fact, Phil, you're a tenant now. Watch your rent go up. It's well, a um, funny story about that. <laughs> wait, wait, you were so, you were so impressed you bought the company. It um, <laughs> so it's a it is a checkmate position, and it's and it's a position that is not going to change overnight. It is here to stay for, I believe, minimum three years that we're going to have this accommodation mm-hmm. crisis and. To some degree, that's going to underpin the value of the asset as well, just from that commercial filter. um, That's that's, that's the important point, Steve. And and when we're talking about this in the context of the property market with the election, which is an immediate thing, be all sort of concluded probably in a month, we know who's going to be uh, in government. But whoever that is, you know, they're going to be the steward of a pretty interesting time for Australia, hiking inflation, 
this ongoing affordability crisis, unemployment at the lowest rate it's been for years. It's like tough for employers to get people. Uh, housing shortages, supply chain shortages, labour shortages. Yes, we're moving. And, and, and let's be frank, the economy is in pretty good health at the moment. And that should continue over time. But there is a lot of, there's a myriad complicated individual but interconnected challenges there. That's going to make it tough to make the call on, on, on how they go about sort of building out the property markets in Australia, Steve, I was only, I was on the ground, you know, I like to get on the ground on Central Coast over the weekend. And um, I actually uh, went into the Wyong RSL Club for um, uh, Anzac Day to get a bite to eat there, but I had a good drive around um, the Wyong area. There's a whole trunch of um, new green, greenfield sites there out through sort of Warner Vale. Uh, so there's still a lot of land to go. They can't build this stuff fast enough, mate. Um, mm. And you see it's all provisioned, all the roads are in, but there's not a lot of houses going up. And I say that's not because there's not people there to that want to buy them and build them. I reckon they're struggling to get the builders in there. And mm. we also see, you know, and this is a big issue, Vic, to your point around uh, the housing crisis. All of these, these builders who have been around for a long time are all going to the wall purely because of these, these contracts that they've set some time ago and they haven't factored in necessarily. Um, and who would have thought that the hike in building materials as it is right now? So where do you start and stop with this? It's intriguing that the only point would be this is a, a podcast for property investors. If you are a property investor, there's a lot of pressure for people to rent your properties. And there's also, therefore, and the government's going to inherit this, this upward pressure on rents as well. So as a property investor, you're probably not in a pretty bad place with all this, irrespective. Yeah. Every time there's a crisis, they are winners and losers, right? And usually people that hold and control the asset are usually the winners. Mm. Yeah. And it's and history has shown that many, many mm. times through the multiple crisis that we've seen over the last 20 or so years. On the back end of every crisis is an upside for those that do control the asset in a very effective way. But as we move forward, just coming back to your point and the interconnectivity around policy, materials, supply and demand, funding, and the list goes on, really brings to the surface what I believe one of the most challenging scenarios that has been seen in generations, like really, really is. And even not just on the upside, like there is a whole cohort of borrowers out there that have never seen a rate with a three in front of it. No. And- they will experience that. Like we can't deny that rates will go up. In fact, I think NZ just put theirs up by 50 basis points. Yep. And Westpac's uh, come out today saying that they reckon by June that there'll be 40 basis points increase. It's going to be a rude shock to a lot of people, but still that only takes us to 0.5%, right? Like, yeah. yeah. So let's keep it in God, perspective here. Let's put it in perspective. Yeah. yeah. And, but also with as, as investors, and we're seeing the escalation of our income being our rents, that spread between the cost of money and the gross yield will stay predominantly the same. There might be a little bit of difference, but it will go back to what it was pre-COVID, let's call it four years ago, when we were all super happy on that gross spread that we were having there. So I, I guess it really comes down to what we become used to and how do we deal with it going forward? But you mentioned builders going to the wall. Plenty, another two large builders went to the wall last week with administrators and liquidators being called in. Mm. Yeah, these are the larger companies, which you know, they've probably got bigger balance sheets and, and bigger challenges that uh, clearly they're facing now. But you reverse engineer that all the way down to the smaller company that is having the same sorts of scenarios, not just from a a bottleneck supply issues, but from a labour issue. So how does that drill in? To the accommodation piece, even though, as you mentioned, up on the central coast, there's you know, various blocks of land for sale or the infrastructure and civil works having been done, as an example, you still need the funding to purchase the land. Mm. You still need the funding with an NVAL result to be able to construct. And there are very few builders out there at the moment that are doing fixed price mm. contracts without a large buffer in between. And it'd be a very game builder, I'd imagine, to take that on as well. So there are complications, many subsets deep that aren't going to help or solve the issue that we're facing right now. Once again, where does it leave the value of, of real estate? Well, I think there will be some areas that will probably concede and give a little bit back, but let's keep it in perspective. They've probably had 30% growth over the last 12 months or thereabouts. 
So when you average it out, it's still quite healthy. But there are areas that we are seeing now, forget what is in the media, forget what the narrative is. But there are areas throughout Australia that we are buying right now where we face daily challenges with A, lack of supply, B, the buoyancy of the market, meaning there are many, many buyers that we are competing against and then trying to find, put the A and the B together to be able to secure a good opportunity. It is very, very challenging. Mm. And I believe that that will go on for some time yet, not in all areas, but certainly, I'm going to say a lot. Yeah. And, and this is it's a good point, Steve, because as a consumer of the media, you would think that, that property markets are in free fall right across Australia. Uh, there's not a lot of people talking about what you're talking about there by saying, hey, look, no, that's not actually the case. Now, mid to longer term, there may be challenges, and you spoke about developers there, and I, if I were developing right now, I'd probably be a little bit concerned. The fact that you don't know what's going to happen with the price of funds, you don't know when you're going to be able to complete your build through labour shortages and or uh, whether or not you're going to be able to get the materials at a reasonable rate. If you're building for the purpose of holding on, you're probably okay. But if you're building property for the purpose of selling it off the plan or, or prior to to building uh, on the hope that you're going to get a valuation uplift at the end of it, I'd be really concerned at the moment. And I reckon there's a lot of people having a lot of nervous, sleepless nights uh, considering what those equations look like. I don't know from your end, Vic, whether or not many of your clients are, are doing even sort of small develops like, you know, whether it's duplexes or three, three, mm. three or four uh, townhouses, what are you seeing there, mate? As a as a strategy at the moment for making money in property property investment, most developments have been paused if they haven't started because the cost you can't define the cost one hundred percent. There's going to be escalations, and it's going to take longer to build as well. And if you come back one and talk about off the plans, we've been always on record to say off the plans aren't a good mix in the portfolio, especially if you're totally reliant on lending to be there once the product is finished and for it to value up. But we've now got a new problem. The problem being, will the property be complete by the time it comes to completion in that sense? And uh, if there's change in circumstances in your circumstances, or if the builder had to cut corners, you know, legally to be able to complete the property, is the value going to value it? And on the outset, is the valuer going to put a larger risk rating on it and therefore impact your loan-to-value ratio position? So there are too many moving parts and too much uncertainty in doing an off-the-plan property. There is more likelihood that it'll go against you as opposed to for you in terms of the end product and end value. And this is where in a market like this, when you've got these challenges being thrown at you, you need to look at it take a long, hard look at the strategy that you're employing in your portfolio. And certainly it may mean that there is a little bit of adjusting in terms of the strategy and not to follow blindly through with a plan that's been set, say, you know, a couple of years back. You need to constantly review it to look at what you've got on your plate today and what the local environment and the global environment from a property point of view and finance point of view is bringing to the plate to then adjust accordingly. And sometimes that means that you actually hold fire and not do your development until you've got a lot more fluidity in the market, so that liquidity in the market, so that you've got the builders that are not collapsing around you. Because like Steve said earlier, you've got the bigger companies collapsing. That doesn't mean that the smaller companies are not struggling because they're facing exactly the same problem, Mm. except the exposure may not be as big and therefore they're able to contain it in the interim. But it's only a matter of time. If the crisis doesn't get resolved from a point of view of supply of both contractors as well as the supply of materials, we are heading for some some significant hurt in in the industry itself. Yeah, and that, I mean, the question raises then, does that actually give existing stock, so ex- existing dwellings, a head start hmm. over the short to medium term because it exists? There's none of the complications and delays of having to build, therefore putting pressure on rent, as an example. So it becomes a whole scarcity issue, which is always a, a common thread that we're looking for. Very interesting times. And in fact, Contrary, once again, to what the media is talking about, according to RE.com, 
that days on market generally average across the country is around about 33 days on the market today, which is a little lower than what it was this time last year. So, but if you were to buy into the media narrative, and I'm being quite pointed here, I guess, you know, that Armageddon is upon us. So what it means is either the stats are wrong or people are jumping in before they can't jump in. And then if I circle all the way back to the first homeowner scheme or the deposit scheme, the government now has a vested interest in the dwelling, therefore in oh, mate, they got their the skin asset. In the game. It's a Correct. Great, it's great news. Great news for property owners Correct. because the government- Therefore the asset, therefore yeah. they, they've, you know, are they- are they saying, well, you know what, we can, we've can. we got 5% in the game across how many tens of thousands of properties? If it falls- We've got 15% falters, in the game. They've got 15% in the game, sort of. Correct. Right, so, you know? so if it falters, do we just wear it? Do we cop it on the chin and say, well, we did our best? Or is it like now we have a bigger vested interest to support the real estate- oh, I think the answer has to be yes, industry. Steve. And, and, mm-hmm. and this is one of the criticisms of the Australian economy is it's got these structural- components of it which are inherently linked with the performance of property and all they're doing really by doing this is exacerbating they're just they're, they're doubling down on their bet a hundred percent that and not only that go how many layers do you want to go deep from the deposit scheme through to the delivery driver of the white goods to the white goods sellers to the painter to the supplier all the way down as i mentioned a couple yeah. of podcasts ago we now ride on the tin and cement roof tiles of Australian residential real estate. That's yep. the large part of the and, economy. And, and the government will protect it because that's where most Australians hold their wealth. And the last thing you would want for, Steve, for property being free for and therefore people's wealth being in free for, family balance sheets are the strongest that ever have been as a result of COVID. Um, people are more ahead on their mortgages than at any time before. And if you dig into those numbers, you're quite surprised how prudent Australian borrowers have been. I think the Australia's LVR is like 32 or 33%, right? Like there's a mm-hmm. lot more money owned in equity than what there is in debt or seven trillion bucks or somewhere other, right? So you hear these headlines and you think, oh, you know, if you want to be chicken little, that the sky's falling in. Well, it's still pretty stable. And the fact that the government has played this hand, double down on the fact that they're intrinsically now invested in the value of Australian real estate, because the last thing they want is Aussies in negative equity having to sell properties and blowing their dough and, and having to go bankrupt, right? It's the last thing they need. To the point, and it's really an important one, I think, Victor, is that you're saying that a lot of people are stalling their development. So it means they have a development site and they're therefore, and, and I know you help a lot of people with this sort of stuff as a strategy. So you want the X factor is you can develop it, but mm-hmm. what you need to be doing when you're building out your portfolio is not knowing what the future looks like making sure that the asset you have today is still a reasonable asset for today and for tomorrow without applying any of the leverage that you can do on it or any of the, the value add you can do it. So smart investors are just going, okay, I'll just wait three years. Yeah, yeah. potentially the cost will come down, but more realistic, it is the surety of being able to complete it in a timely fashion. Mm. That's the more important bit, right? Because it does impact finance. It does impact your mortgages. And it, um, while you're doing the development you're exposed in terms of not having any income supporting that debt for the time frame that you're building. And if you've doubled your time frame, you've actually doubled your holding cost as well, right? Now, I get it that you'll be drawing the money down in stages. And so therefore, it may be that you know your interest payments aren't that pronounced, but it also means that you're not getting any income from that property for that much longer. And no tax advantages as well. Yeah, mm. true. So the question then, Steve, why... Are we led to believe that the Australian property market is in free fall? And there's there's a lot of examples that they keep pulling out. Most of them sort of in a in a city, uh, Sydney and Melbourne, saying, "Hey, this property four months ago would have sold for one hundred fifty thousand dollars more. Now it's at this." And and these are the the properties making the headlines. Um, why does this narrative need to be propagated? Is it because fear sells? Because you know you've got the ground truth right, and you speak about these areas, and it'd be handy if you can give us some. Which areas we're we seeing the opposite narrative, where it's hard to find good quality assets. There's competition. There's you know lack of stock on market. There's more buyers. You know which is the market that we have been in. Well, the the easy and short answer to that is you've got Queensland doing extremely well. You've got Adelaide doing extremely well. You've got parts of Perth doing extremely well. You've got regional areas throughout Queensland. Victoria and New South Wales doing extremely well. 
so the the generalization i guess in terms of the narrative is very easy to just spew out mm-hmm. there's not a lot of research that is necessary to go in behind it is it a propaganda tool who knows do i think as the narrative spills out quite deliberately maybe the powers to be hope that it's a softer landing and it's the asset class in terms of its growth is more controllable more subdued which i would buy into mm. to be fair because we don't like vertical growth over the long it just doesn't make sense it's not sustainable but those areas that have come back as you like you pull an example of 150 odd thousand dollars and we know of those areas but once again let's let's be real and let's be truthful around well what have they done over the last 3 years They've done extremely well, and you can't sustain that rate of growth. So when we reverse engineer historically back over, let's call it 10 years, the compound annual growth is well, and I'd probably suggest even in excess of its historical averages. Mm. And that's what a historical average is. And there are some areas which are catching up still to the historical averages. So buying into the generalization, I think, well, you know, do that at your own peril. But there is certainly a degree of people that are, yeah, there may be an agenda there. Mm. Yeah, maybe it's the maybe it's the people that uh, love to peddle that stuff. I don't know. Could it be something as simple as, well, I've missed the boat, so I feel pretty ordinary about it. Happen. Well, you know, this is this whole those who aren't invested in property or whether it's owner occupied or as a property investor, probably sitting around going, so in the last year it's gone up another twenty five percent. I'm never going to be able to get into property, right? Like this is I, I get that and I understand it, but there's a whole bunch of other ways. First time investors can get into the market. You know, these living wheels now that parents are giving, they're sort of guaranteeing them into mortgages. Like there's a whole bunch of different ways to accelerate your purchase. And property is still largely, if you want to be an investor, largely accessible to all Australians with a job. And guess what? Most Australians have a job these days. Um, and if they don't, if they don't, they'll have one soon. Yeah, they, they, they probably they probably need one. And maybe we can do that for another chat, as in how do you actually get into start investing in property if you don't have those big deposits and you don't want to use those those government schemes, but let's get a bit practical. So we sort of painted this picture of of property markets. Um, I spoke to Steve about this on a a chat the other day. My view is that we're going to slide back into a market where the market itself is not going to uh, do the heavy work for you in terms of capital growth. You've got to work for your capital growth. Um, uh, And I remember when I I first started doing stuff uh, with you guys 10 years ago, manufacturing equity was the big thing. We'd get mm-hmm. in there, we'd find good assets that needed some some TLC, and we'd get a natural uplift by putting some sweat equity into it. We're going to be start moving back in those markets. Rents are spiking. Uh, you need to be right across this stuff at the moment as a property investor because it's all about yield now as well as um, manufacturing the equity. So that's what I'm seeing the smart guys and girls are doing as property investors. Uh, but you're a lot closer to it than I am. What else should you be considering? Look, I think uh, the best way to answer that is to repeat one of the rhetoric questions we get for from novice investors is, you know, where should I buy? What should I buy? Have I missed the market, right? Or is it too late to start now? The correct question that one needs to ask is, what makes sense to buy in my portfolio right now, mm-hmm. given the market, given my circumstances? So what should I buy? Not, is it too late for me to get started, right? Because you, look, you need to look at it from a medium to long-term perspective. And you're right, as the market changes, as interest rates change, supply change, uh, stall, and uh, prices go up, down, sideways, both rent and value, your strategy needs to be adjusted slightly to cater for that. So what used to work, say, two years, three years, four years ago, won't work today in your portfolio. What was a good foundational property five years ago might not be a good foundational property right now. So we need to look at all of those things, but still bring it back to one really simple factor. What are we trying to achieve? And can we afford to hold on to this asset during the lean times? And by the lean times, I mean when the finance market is not as free-flowing, whether it is stalled by a decline in equity or whether it is stalled by a decline in serviceability from the bank's point of view. We need to look at it from a worst case scenario and make sure that one of the one of the gems that came out of our staff meeting this, this morning was the fact that there are a lot of people that want to get started, that want to start investing, but that they're not willing 
to change or adjust their lifestyle. And Melissa, who is our client liaison officer, so she's she is the person that you speak with uh, when you first contact us. Lots of investing experience, has got a fairly good uh, and large property portfolio. She came up with an example to say that, well, if you've started, if you decided that you're going to lose weight and you haven't changed anything, so you have not changed your diet, you haven't started exercising, you haven't watched what you're eating, you're not going to get your result. And the same thing is true with property investing. If you are looking at investing towards a goal, if you're not going to make basic changes in your finance structure and your approach and thought process towards debt, you're not going to get anywhere. You'll always find excuses of the market potentially crashing or the interest rates going too high or there they aren't enough suitable properties for me because you haven't done the fundamentals. You haven't prepared yourself to start investing. Fair cop. And this is this uh, outsourcing of responsibilities from property investors I see time and time again, as in I want, I want, I want, but I won't do, I won't do, I won't do. Fortunately, there's a lot of professionals out there to support people, buyers, agents uh, included like yourselves and mortgage brokers and you know, all the sundry of your accountant. But if you're not invested in the outcome, guess what? It's not going to happen. Mm. And you can't outsource that stuff. So if you want to get cracky, if you listen to this going, I want to get into property, guess what? You speak to any property investor, and I can probably speak on behalf of uh, Stephen Vick and any other property investor, the thousands that I've spoken to uh, over the years. Two main mistakes. One of them is always, I wish I started earlier. And the other one is, I wish I did more when I could. Uh, yeah. And I think everyone falls into that bucket. So yeah, I think everybody does. I do. Vic does. Mm-hmm. You would. Mm. But it's all retrospective, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, One size and be I get, in. Well, and and that experience and potentially the the time is showing the results. So, you know, it's very easy to to look back and say, I wish I could or would have didn't. Mm. But for me, I think there's a massive difference between investing and being an investor. Massive difference. Investing is just a very passive way to do it. I'll get something, whatever the asset class is, and I'll just sit back, relax, and I'll let time do all the work. Does it work? Yes, it does. But I believe when you're an investor, which means that you have a good understanding of what you're trying to achieve, what those different components and mechanisms are, and how you go about it and creating the team around you, which is many deep, then you are an investor when you take action and continually refine what you're trying to to achieve and how you go about it, Mm. because that's when you don't leave opportunity on the table. Great. I mean, take today's present example with COVID. If you were an investor, as COVID initiated and started to become apparent that we weren't all going to die within the first month, investors took stock. They doubled down. They saw an opportunity they saw what was potentially going to happen, and you could mention supply and demand and well, the position we're in today, and they set themselves because they're investors. Investing would have been chasing the market because of everybody else's result. Well, I just might, I just better get into it mm. rather than without any solid concept or plan to evolve. And everyone can be an investor, and it's never too late. Yeah. Never and, too late. And, and property, the good thing, property is a lot more forgiving than other investments if you have the robustness in your personal situation to to weather market cycles. And you, you see these stories now of people betting on Netflix over the last uh, mm. uh, couple of months and, and blowing billions of dollars, you know, as, as these things uh, just lose um, a couple of little tweaks here and there and uh, they start losing massive amounts of uh, uh, their value. So fortunately, as we've spoken about in this podcast, the government, the government has always been, irrespective of who that government is, highly invested in uh, real estate in Australia, and that is a forgiving thing. Our financial system is largely built around uh, how you borrow money against uh, real estate. And we have this great thing called uh, leverage, uh, where banks uh, lend you uh, part of the purchase price, and uh, another great thing called negative gearing, uh, which can be a great utility for people when they're starting. Other investment journey. Um, you know, it's pretty hard to always be negatively geared as your property gets bigger and rents go up mm-hmm. and we go through cycles that there are right now, but that's just a natural outcome. Uh, yeah, that that's happens, also but- the that's also the yeah, the whole argument around say last election with the Labor Party you know, wanting to rid the negative gearing mm-hmm. benefits. An investor doesn't want a negative gear. That's not the outcome, that's not the goal. The goal is to be completely positive, unencumbered. Mm-hmm. 
where the negative gearing component doesn't work. Something just came to my head, though. I wonder, mm. I wonder if we took on an American esque model around a component of their finance with thirty year fixed rates. Could that mm. be a could that be a component to in, encourage people to get into the market because they know for thirty years they're set. Stability. That's their stability and their biggest outgoings. It actually surprises me. I'm sure there's yeah, but who's, gonna, who's, gonna, who's gonna who's gonna lock in a rate now at five point five percent, right? Yeah, but what about if you did it a year ago, two years yeah. ago? I you know what? I reckon there would be a hell of a lot of people that would lock in for 30 years at five and a half percent. You would, wouldn't you? No. Oh, <laughs> I'd, I'd probably do it just for an experiment, some. Yeah. Like I'm just coming, like I've mentioned a hundred times, I'm just coming off 4.99 fixed yeah. on some. And, and the rate's on the way back up. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. But, and, but, you know, I was having this conversation over the weekend with myself, as I do. So, well, okay, so I'm going into a variable of whatever it is, two point something or other, 2.8, 3.1. It, um, I was extremely comfortable at 4.99. Mm. So eventually it may get back up to there, but I'll reap the rewards of the lower rate. To begin with, but if we had a thirty-year fixed rate, I, I would I would hazard a guess, take a punt, have a bet that a lot of people would take the, that on. But the thing is that also, and a lot of people who are tuning into this, you know, I speak to a lot of property investors. I've got a particular mindset. I associate myself with other people with a very similar mindset. People that tune into this have a very similar mindset. A lot of people, Steve, still think the great Australian dream is buying a house in the suburbs and paying it off. And I'm sure Correct. they would. They would take 30-year fixed mortgages. They just go, okay, that's what I'm supposed to do. And it's quite funny. You must see it all the time where, where, where there's a light bulb moment for people to go, oh, hang on a second. I can actually like own a property, but then I can also invest in property. Yeah, I can do both. Money. I can mm. do both. Who would have thought? But I, there's, a, there's a couple of social media groups yeah, that I am not a me- uh, part of, but just- yeah, You're an agitator in. No, no. He's no, a lurker. I'm a lurker. <laughs> Lurks in the shadows. Yeah. yeah, and they're not um, – they're an investing um, social media page across all things and budgeting and bits and pieces, mm-hmm. yeah? Mm-hmm. And I see some of the advice. Yeah, someone will ask a question, rightly so, because that's what the group is for, and, but then you'll get 100 comments on what they should do mm-hmm. from Jack, Jill, and whomever else who you know nothing about, what their qualifications, what their experience. But some of the advice that I see – or opinions perhaps, is just so, so wrong. And this is a group. Almost criminal. Yeah, and this is a group with, I think there's like a quarter of a million members. It's it's really dangerous. Well, you see ASIC now is um, clamping down on these influencers, these financial influencers who are all got these big social media followings and they're making uh, recommendations of how people should be uh, going through wealth creation, and a lot of them don't have the required licensing to do that. Uh, you've got to be really careful with this stuff. Well, there's the inflection point because a lot mm. of people are leaving the financial planning world, business, industry, because of the cost of regulation and compliance that it's mm. now, and people do, the, the consumer doesn't want to pay for that advice because they're having to hike their prices yeah. to stay profitable, and they're just leaving the industry. People are just, well, I can't get the clients. No one's willing to pay for this. So I am leaving the industry. So if the government is trying to regulate the Finfluencers, it's a great name. Finfluencers. Um, and wanting- what are, are you a prop fluencer? Prop. <laughs> <laughs> no, one's, no one's put a monkey around. It's a real influencer. No, 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 no. But I, I, I still, actually, I was going to mention one of my great ideas, but I won't. Um, yeah. But so who's going to give the advice? At the end of the day, if there's nobody yeah. within the industry mm-hmm. to do it, this is so, it. Right? And but then people can just go and invest in crypto, and you know, there's plenty of people flogging that stuff at the moment. Well, yeah. and that goes back to you know one of the things that we've talked about a couple of times, many many podcasts ago, around how technology today is shaping markets more so than it mm. ever has, and as a result of that, the data, the historical averages and pressure points of yesteryear are probably not relevant today. Agree. Then throw in what we've just experienced around COVID and how it's changed the world more so that some of those data points and historical moments are irrelevant. Well, it's, one a, big, thing it's you, a big brand new world and you, big, you yeah, have that, to get, get on it or you, you'll be left behind. Well, there's one thing you can guarantee investing in properties that things will change. Gotcha. It's an absolute given. Uh, it's how you respond and react to that. Uh, is it what makes you a better investor? And we speak about that on Investing Insights, the right property group. It's um, good to chat, guys. Uh, Geez, we go through. That's just 
blink, blink, blink my eyes and we're sort of at the end of the podcast. Uh, Vic, I know you guys, are you're, you're at it, you're smack bang doing what you do well. Uh, best way for people to connect in with uh, with you and your team. And I know it sort of takes takes time and you guys are busy, but um, there's you're there ready to chat to new people. Yeah, absolutely we are. Uh, and also we are expanding our team. So uh, if you're wanting to uh, join an elite company, Send your resumes to questions at rightpropertygroup.com.au. Our business manager, Kate, will be in touch with you. You have to be a property investor. You need to have a few portfolio properties under your belt to join our company. And there are quite a few positions open at the moment. We what are you looking for, Vic? What sort of people? Because I know um, uh, that you know the property advisory, there's a lot of different skill sets inside of it. Correct. Yeah. We, and, and we will coach and train the right persons or right people to the position in itself. And you don't need to be based in Sydney. You can be anywhere and send your resumes in. Uh, so questions at rightpropertygroup.com.au. If you wanted to have a chat with myself or Steve, obviously there is a bit of a process. You need to have a chat with Melissa first. She is an accomplished property investor. And what she does is help you get ready so you get the best out of mine and Steve's time. You do get to speak with us directly, but there is a bit of a process to get you ready to, so that we can give you pertinent advice or pertinent recommendation in terms of what you need to do to get to your goals using property as a vehicle. Sounds pretty good. Um, well, uh, next time we get together, we may be able to do a post-election wrap-up. Who knows? Um, who knows? Who knows? Well, we, knows? we deliberately I, haven't, uh, via the podcast or our Facebook lives, really talked about the budget quite deliberately because we mm-hmm. don't know where the, you know, the ball will drop. That's so close, you know, from budget to Correct. election. And, and I see... see uh, uh, Scomo's out there campaigning hard. Uh, as it sits right now, uh, literary opposition Albanese is locked up at home with COVID. But I do note he was a property investor, and there were some glowing uh, reports about him as a property investor in the papers over the weekend. I don't know if you saw it, saying that he he dropped his rent by twenty five percent at the start of COVID to for, for someone who was a small business owner and uh, and left it there. So I um, wonder if he's going to revise that upwards. <laughs> uh, only after the elections. <laughs> yeah. we'll, Smart we'll PR see. move. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. But uh, that's uh, Victor Kumar and uh, Steve Waters, directors at Right Property Group. Gents, thanks for your time. Remember, go check these guys out, rightpropertygroup.com.au. We'll see you again next time. Until then, bye-bye. The information featured in this podcast is general in nature, does not take into consideration your financial situation or individual needs and should not be relied upon. Before making any investment, insurance, tax, property or financial planning decision, you should consult a licensed professional who can advise whether your decision is appropriate for you.